This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Have you ever thought about the origin of the plants you've bought at your local plant store? Today we take you on a tour of Monrovia Nursery Company in Granby, Connecticut. It's the only Monrovia farm in the Northeast, and it sits on 350 acres. This hour, Charlie Nardozzi, host of the Connecticut Garden Journal on WNPR, joins me as we learn about the plants cultivated by Monrovia. We'll learn about some of the new plants coming to market and also hear from Monrovia craftsmen, as they're called, about techniques to keep some of your favorite shrubs like rhododendrons coming back each season. How's your summer garden looking this year? And what kinds of plants do you want to incorporate in your yard? Join our conversation. Email where we live at WMPR.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Charlie, so good to see you. It's so great to be here. And look where we are. Uh, can you describe where we are exactly? We were at a plant nursery, uh, but maybe a lot of our listeners don't even know that this plant nursery is here in Granby, Connecticut. Yeah, we're at Monrovia Nursery. So this is a grower. This is where all those plants you buy in garden centers and home centers, this is where they come from. Someone's growing them. And Monrovia is one of the biggest plant growers in the country. They have four locations in Oregon, California, Georgia, and now here in Connecticut. They've only been in this location for about four years. And before it was Monrovia, you said that it was another long time nursery here in this site? Yes, it was Imperial Nurseries, which had been here many, many years, and so they sold out to Monrovia. And they have hundreds of acres under cultivation, so they have thousands of plants all over the place, and we're going to get a tour. So for those of us who've never actually toured a plant nursery of this size, are these plants types of plants that this particular nursery is breeding specifically uh, and then selling to particular stores or are these uh, some of these uh, types of plants what you would see in other places are more common? They have a whole range of plants so they have some of the common plants that you would see they have some new things always coming through they're propagating plants they're what they call finishing plants so they bring in as a little plant and then they finish it to a big plant so it's a saleable size and then they ship it all around the country in this area um, in this store here I think they they specialize a lot in Japanese maples and rhododendrons, but they certainly have all kinds of perennials and shrubs and trees. I'm glad you brought up uh, rhododendrons because those are a popular uh, shrub that our listeners always ask about when you're on our show. And then also Japanese maples. When is a good time to plant those two? Well, it'd be good for both of those to be planted in the spring. When it's cool, nice and rainy, they can get really established before the heat of the summer really starts coming on. The other time, of course, would be in the fall, and rhododendrons would be okay with that. Japanese maple, as long as it's a protected spot, it would be probably okay to plant in the fall as well. As we go on this tour, what are you most interested in learning about? Well, I'm kind of a plant geek, so I'm always... I didn't know that. Couldn't tell. (laughs) So I'm always interested in new things and new varieties and new plants that are out there. But I'm also interested in how they're growing things because there's been a big emphasis in the nursery world to be more organically oriented, more ecologically friendly. A lot of these plants are grown in greenhouses to uh, take care of the weather and kind of protect them. And we see many, many greenhouses out there. In fact, way off in the distance, I see a bus coming. I bet you that's how we're going to get around. We start the bus tour with guide Monrovia's Mark Hickson. Today we're going to drive the nursery and show you a few techniques that we use on growing our plants, uh, but you're coming into the factory to see how we do it. And uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be inspired by what we do here and uh, really uh, see what goes into a Monrovia plant. And uh, the area we're going to roll into now up on your right hand side we call it the uh, pot and pot tree area. So it's an area where we take trees and we stick them in the ground and uh, they are sitting in another container so they don't blow over. And they are sitting in there, they're being fertigated and watered through drip lines. So they're constantly just being nurtured to grow on. And all these trees were planted uh, right around February this year. And we are just starting to get into them now and sell them. So I bought, we purchased the, uh, I'll call it a bare root tree. We can it and flip it pretty quickly. So this year, next time, all that area will be emptied and I'll put the next crop right back down again. So we're turning this area over and there's about 20,000 trees sitting in that area. On our right, we see hundreds of small trees, some with multiple branches tied to a frame, a technique known as espalier. These right here, those are fruit trees. And you can see all the different color bands on each limb. Each one is a different variety of of, uh, apple. We call it the fruit cocktail. And that goes to your Zen gardeners. Those are the ones that want to eat everything they're planting. And it's also for, you don't have to plant a grove of them. You can plant one or two and get different kinds of fruit off of that. So um, it also, they flower a little bit later. Each one's a little bit different, so they're not all flowering at the same time. So 
it's a novelty item that is continuing to grow as new gardeners are coming into our segment. So uh, it's, a, it's an entity that we just keep adding more units in and growing. Remember how I told you where we live listeners always ask Charlie Nardozzi about a particular flowering shrub? Well, it's one Monrovia specializes in. One of the biggest items we grow in this nursery is rhododendron. Connecticut, this valley here is great for growing rhododendron. It's probably the biggest crop we grow in this nursery. It's our niche item. And we put a lot of time and handcrafted effort into these roadies. And we're going to meet the grower up here and uh, the plant health coach that helps us take care of them all. And have a couple of things to say on how we grow these plants. The bus stops next to rows and rows of uncovered greenhouses filled with hundreds of rhododendrons not in bloom. Tour guide Mark Hickson introduces us to Yukon grad John Russell. So you have a... Uh... Rhododendron Rosie Melgans here, and we have a process that's a little unique, uh, the way we prune rhododendron. Many nurseries will shear them, and uh, that creates a decent plant, uh, but when we want to get good branching and a nice compact plant that has great bud set, uh, we go through and we pinch. We pinch twice a year. We'll do a winter pinch from like October uh, through even, even into March, and then we do a summer pinch right now Starting around mid-June, we'll go until we try to be done before uh, the first week of July is done. So pinching is fairly simple. We have our crews go through and they are, uh, they are very skilled craftsmen. So they'll go through with both hands and they're just pinching like that. And like on a plant like this, we'll do up to 25 pinches. So we'll tell our crews, hey, you know, on this crop, we need 20 pinches and then they'll go through and, you know, one, two, three, four, up to 10, and plants done, they go to the next one. And that's what creates these really dense plants. If you know rhododendron rosy melgans, for example, if you don't pinch it, and specifically this, this time of year, uh, a lot of these vegetative buds will just continue to uh, exhibit their apical dominance. So they'll stretch out and you'll get, you'll get that kind of open plant. Uh, you know, when you pinch, you get, you know, three, four breaks on each, and uh, it really makes a big difference. Um, I have some out here. If anybody wants to learn the technique, I can show you quick if you want to try one. Has anybody done this before? Along with so, us on the tour are gardening experts and writers who are more than excited to learn the right way to pinch a rhododendron. From there, another Monrovia staff member, Jim Wells, talks about how they avoid insect pests. So after he's done pinching, we'll go through with a fungicide and spray so no disease gets in the open wound. Uh, we also use pheromone traps. You see one hanging there in the house. Uh, that's for rhododendron bore. And um, what happens with the boar is uh, they only live for a couple of days. The adults live for a couple of days. So once you see one caught in your trap, you have to go spray right away because they're gone and then the female will lay the egg in the on the plant in the crotch and when it hatches it'll drill into the tree and stay there all winter long and just go into the bush and keep eating all winter long and then it'll come out probably early June and then they're around start the cycle again for one or two days so we have about 80 traps out now uh, we actually there's a boar in that trap right now but it's not a rhododendron boar it's a lilac boar um, so they're still flying around now, but it's getting pretty close to the end of their cycle. After visiting the rhododendrons, we get back on the bus and are driven to another location. Guide Mark Hickson explains how this gigantic plant nursery keeps track of its stock. So a couple of things as we're driving around, you'll see in the, each corner of the nursery, each corner of the house is a stake, and one's painted, there's a flag. Those are all for our inventory of, the, of what's in the house. Every stake, when we can it, uh, there's the, uh, the canning day, like its birthday is on there. And then we have the harvest date, when we know it's going to be ready. So if I'm out here or anybody's out here, they know if I'm looking at that plant, I can say it'll be ready in another couple weeks, another month, or next year. So we know accurately what we're looking at. It also has the plant standard, the height we're growing it to. And all nurseries, all four nurseries have the same plant standard for the species we're growing. So we know if I'm coming out here, this will be a 24 inch plant by 24 inch. And the grower knows it, we know that's the height we're trying to get to. So they always come out the same size when they come off the nursery. 
inventory department is about eight people in our inventory department and it's their job to make sure all this is accurate moving around the nursery when you're disposing of uh, plants putting new ones on the ground it's all getting entered into the computer so I can sell it accurately I know how many's in the house um, you all see how sandy it is in here my yard I only live five miles from here and I'm a pick and axe guy when I'm digging I do not have sand like this so this has a great aquifer underneath this nursery Miller High Life back in the 50s was going to come on this nursery or come on this land and and put a facility here but the town didn't want any more beer drinkers so it said none they didn't allow them in so the nursery came in so you can see here on the left is more just of that container pot and pot program those are limelight hydrangeas there and I'm due to go in there and trim that because I'm going to slow it down and get the flower for me in September versus right now as they go to color because I need to make the color last longer so I can take a longer time selling the entire crop. So you'll see as we come through here on your right, there's a lot of perennials. Uh, you'll see some perennials that are can tight still. Hostas and peonies we grow for two years here because we want chunky, I call them chunky monkeys. We want big heavy plants coming out of here. So that homeowner will go to that plant first because it's a big voluptuous, nice size plant versus one that was just stuck in January, sold three months later. So this is all boxwood on your left hand side. Boxwood is a very good plant in several ways. The deer don't really bother it for the most part. They're starting to browse it. Um, there is boxwood blight out there so you have to watch that. And we do a lot of preventativeness here uh, on boxwood blight. We have the Connecticut Ag Station come in every uh, three to four months, go through our crop, make sure we are clean. We also limit the traffic into the crop. Uh, we've now started that we normally would get out and tour and walk through that crop. We are not walking in the crop because you've been other places. You could have a potential risk into our crop. So it's a precious crop. We don't let anybody much walk into that crop. On your right is a nice crop of shamrock inkberry. Another very nice plant. Uh, deer don't tend to bother that one either. So it's a, you can see how nice and thick it grows. Uh, and it is still growing. It'll be ready in probably about four more weeks. And we'll get into it. So what you're seeing here is this is a brand new crop. Now once come out of the house, that crop is meant for 2019, for next spring. I will sell 30% of that about right now for the fall. And the rest is mainly for next year. In our climate here, we have to finish the plant at the end of the season. By September 1st, October 1st, they're gonna be done growing and they need to be ready to be going for next year. So you can see we're rolling into barberry. Barberry is a very invasive plant in Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire has been banned. I am now thinking of taking it out of here because my main salespeople are in Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and I could grow something much nicer on there than barberry. Barberry is very popular in the Midwest. They've not banned many plants out there. We still ship a lot of burning bush into the Midwest. Uh, it's a very profitable plant for us, but I'd rather have a Japanese maple on there, which I can more dollars can come off that real estate than a barberry. So we are thinking about taking that out of this production. It would take us about um, two to three years to remove it from the process of growing. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. You're listening to Mark Hickson, an employee of Monrovia Nursery Company, leading us on a tour of its Granby, Connecticut location. At any given time, this farm has more than 1.3 million plants destined for a garden store near you. After the break, we continue our tour and hear about the people who work at this nursery, including hundreds of seasonal employees. When you buy plants, do you ever wonder where they come from? Join our conversation. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're getting the story behind the plants you see at your local nursery. Some of them are cultivated at a massive nursery in Granby, Connecticut. It's called Monrovia, and we took a tour recently to learn more. While there, we met Kate Karam, Monrovia's editorial director, who explained the history of the nursery company. Monrovia is actually a really large company, and we sell 
tens of millions of plants a year. Um, we have four growing grounds and that allows us to cover all different climates across the country. So we're here in Connecticut. We're also in um, the southern portion of um, Georgia. We're in um, the hot part of California in Visalia, right, right in the midsection of it. And we're up on the coast in Oregon in um, Dayton. So why Connecticut? All of our plants sit on the ground for at least two winters before they're sold. So they're acclimated to the local weather so that when they go into your garden, we've already given them the worst that can be thrown at it in terms of weather. So we chose to have a Connecticut nursery because we wanted to have plants that were colder zones and that were acclimated to this region in particular. And so about four years ago, we um, came across a nursery that was up for sale, and we purchased it and have made it a Monrovia nursery over the course of four years. Tell us about your workforce here. How many uh, people are employed that live in Connecticut, and how many are your seasonal workers? So we have um, probably all told with sales staff and everybody about 200 workers. I would say of that, probably half of them are seasonal, and the other half are here um, year-round. Is actually, even though you know we kind of close up shop in October, there's actually a lot that goes on during the winter. We continue to do propagation and canning, and we learned about pinching today, and um, and other things that have to be done just to maintain a large nursery. I was interested in the seasonal workers because uh, often they are working uh, in the agriculture fields. And I'm wondering if you could talk about the uh, importance of Monrovia depending on these workers who come from all over to come and work here. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that would not only just be so in Connecticut, but we um, have a seasonal workforce in all of our nurseries. And in particularly in California, we would not be able to do what we do without having a very robust um, guest worker program. And um, we depend on them. We have had um, guest workers who have come back to Monrovia for 20 years. They, they go home and they come back. And um, they're so incredibly talented. And we actually invest a lot of our resources in training and keeping people, even seasonal workers. Um, we have a rotation um, system where everybody learns everybody else's jobs, which is not only a morale booster, but it's really necessary because you never know when you're going to need all hands in one part of the nursery. And so um, everybody, myself, um, and everyone um, is talented at doing everything. I have done my share of propagation as well as sitting behind a desk and talking about marketing. Can you give us an idea of where your seasonal workers are from? Uh, I live in Suffield and there are still shade tobacco farms mm -hmm. and a lot of the seasonal workers that have worked on family farms have been there for generations, right. many from Jamaica. Where do your workers come from? I think from? that's true. I think a lot of them are from the Caribbean that are up in here and a lot of them are also from um, Central and South America. Um, the largest part of our workforce, I think, in, in California in particular, um, definitely comes from Mexico and Latin America. Is it hard to find labor yes. to work in this industry? And, and why? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard work. It's out in the sun. It takes, um, a, takes a surprising amount of training to be actually good at what you do. Um, but more than anything else, it just takes endurance and love of plants. I mean, as I said, um, some of our workers um, who I've worked with have been here um, doing this kind of work for 20 years. And you, you have to love it to come back every year and do it. Um, but it's also a very community-oriented company. I mean, we all feel very much like a big family. I know everybody says that about their company, but we actually do feel like a big family. And um, we know each other's names, and we know each other's birthdays, and we're just tight. So give us an, an idea of that journey that the plant takes from your nursery, whether it's here in Granby or in California or in Oregon, uh, to uh, either a big box store like mm -hmm. Lowe's or to one of the independent uh, nurseries that people have in their community. Right. So it's a really interesting journey because we sort of, we, like, we make our plants. And so our plants are either created by tissue culture or seed or, or graft. And so we start everything from scratch and it takes several generations of, of um, months and, um, and for plants to evolve to the point where we are ready to sell it. Um, we are always planning a couple of years ahead. So if you ever do get the chance to come to one of our growing grounds, you'll see that there's finished goods and then there's two and three and four year out plants. So we're always in a constant cycle of creating more plants. So the journey is that the plants go from our our um, nursery when they're ready to go and um, they go to your local garden center and hopefully home to you. We have a new um, service. We have um, something called Shop Monrovia, which is new over the last couple of years. And that's because no garden center can bring in all of the plants that we grow. We, we, we have 
3,000 different varieties and who carry all that. So you can now go online and order plants from us and have them delivered to a local garden center to pick up. So our entire inventory is open to anybody that wants to order it. And that's been a real game changer for us, but also for the garden center owners who can have a wider palette of plants without having to actually stock them. And when it comes to cost, are these choices affordable? Well, you know, affordability is in the eye of the beholder. (laughs) Um, I will say that we sell a lot of plants, so I think that there are people for whom um, cost is not an issue. But more often than not, um, our plants are just, we have customers who will only use Monrovia plants. And I think that the company, having been around for 90 years, has proven that we do something different. And what we do differently is we grow our plants in a different way than a lot of other nurseries do. We have custom soil mixes. We do a lot more hand pruning. Um, if you look at one of our boxwoods, for example, which is a commodity plant that you can buy just about anywhere, if you look at one of ours, it's been hand pruned three times and until so it's a perfect shape. And you never have to like go through a, like a bin of 50 to find five that match every one of them matches so it's the level of care and precision that we give to our plants that makes the difference we sell for example we sell topiary which um, are beautiful they take eight years to um, to create and they're hand pruned five times by one person who owns that plant and that's a real investment to try to keep your plants looking beautiful when they come to you or we plant grapes and instead of putting one vine in a cane we in a, in a container we put five of them so that when that gets to you, it's huge and it's ready to make fruit. And those are the differences that we make. Throughout the tour, we've heard guide Mark Hickson mention the term canning. Hickson explained that's just another word for potting. In front of us stands a small warehouse where nearly a dozen workers are canning plants. A front loader on the outside scoops potting soil and dumps it into a large machine. From there, the machine fills pots with the soil and then workers add the plants to them as the pots move along a conveyor belt. Finally, another two workers guide the finished plants to a tractor bed. We meet the official canning coach at Monrovia, Rob O'Connor. And then from here it goes through a shower, into a line, we'll see more more wagons out there, and there's there's crews out picking up and putting down and spacing. So they'll come and pick them up and bring them out. We have two crews going at the same time right now. We bring our liners in, It's, it's more or less the same thing, but there's someone that has to put the liner into the pot and then they put the soil around it and pack it firm and get it, make sure we make sure you get it in the center and not buried too deep because you can uh, ruin a plant thinking you did a good job but you buried it too deep and if you can do a lousy job, leaner, and it's a, it becomes scrap. O'Connor says workers can pot anywhere from 5,000 up to 14,000 plants a day depending on the size of the pot. Back on the bus, guide Mark Hickson explains how the greenhouses are laid out. I was mentioning earlier that on your right, the greenhouses you see over there, those are the, it's the bullpen area. Bullpen's like baseball, the next batter's warming up. Those are the next plants that could potentially be coming into production. And what we do is when we see that that plant is uh, looking good, we recommend it into our catch ball team, who then decides yes or no to start producing. So every nursery has it, it's locked under key because there's proprietary plants in there that if we decide not to do it, we throw it away. We can't just let it go back out into the market area. Some of the giant heaps of plant material Monrovia uses include the coarse fiber from coconut husks called coir. And you can see our soil uh, compound where we put our and scrap things up and reuse it back in again. So we started a program, and I'm always thinking on the sales side of it, is how do I get back into that garden center with more plants? So what we started a few years ago was a recycle program where we gave the garden center a bin wrapped nicely and the consumer can bring their cans into the garden center and when I deliver more plants, I'll pick the bin up and get it recycled back to here. So there's a fee for that. We charge an annual fee of $400 for them to have that bin, but we'll come in and take their recyclables out and then bring it here because I'm recycling a lot. So you can see it, that's got a lot of buddleia on it. You can see from here all the buds on that buddleia and roses that are coming up. That's just colors, all we're trying to sell right now. Buddleia is the popular butterfly bush found in most garden centers. On your right, is a, you can see how these plants come on. So this is the next crop of uh, um, Spirea uh, Big Bang. You can see the color on it, it's like candy corn. And um, this crop is really meant for next year, but I'll get into it now and start selling it. It may not flower now, but the foliage is enough to spark a lot of color in a garden center. So what we're gonna stop at next is a, um, 
Uh, it's called little. It's called uh, little thunder. So we're going to show you how we prune our plants with using a machine instead of our craftsman. As you can be imagine standing over, pruning with your back like this for thousands of plants, hours on day. So now we're, we've got a machine in here that's a Monrovia patent machine that's at every nursery, used for for um, pruning our plants. This machine brings automation to the fields as three workers load plants on a conveyor belt to be pruned quickly and efficiently. They're needed because the hoop houses prevent the machine from accessing the plants. The machine is uh, its very good for the craftsman because uh, you can imagine doing this whole thing with shears. It's very uh, labor intensive, but with pruning shears, doing that all day, there's a lot of impact. It can be tough on your wrists specifically. Uh, but even on their back, if you're uh, if you're hunched over all day uh, pruning, so uh, ergonomically this is a much uh, superior process. But it's also uh, great for getting that consistency uh, that we need. Big benefit of this machine also, uh, besides consistency and ergonomics, is that it collects the debris, uh, which is great for plant health. Uh, any any debris that is left behind will come back and clean out. So what plants sell well in particular regions of the country? Back on the bus, guide Mark Hickson says sometimes it all hinges on color. Long Island loves yellow plants. For whatever reason, we call it the Gold Coast. One is because there's a lot of gold on that coastline. But um, they love yellow plants, so we produce quite a bit of plants for, for that reason. And yellow is also just a good color early on in the garden before anything else is awake, that it gives you a great splash of color. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. That was Monrovia employee Mark Hickson, who showed us around at the company's nursery located in Granby, Connecticut. And thanks to Charlie Nardozzi, host of the Connecticut Garden Journal on WMPR, for joining us on the tour. You can learn more about Monrovia Nursery Company at monrovia.com. Now, are you trying to incorporate more native plants in your yard? Coming up, co-authors of the book Native Plants for New England Gardens will join us to tell you how. And you can join the conversation, too. Email where we live at WMPR.org. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We've been focusing on gardening this hour. There are so many choices, as we heard during our tour at Monrovia Nursery Company in Granby, Connecticut. But there's also a movement out there to incorporate more native plants into our landscapes. Which native plants are best suited for your backyard? There's a book for that. It's called Native Plants for New England Gardens. We spoke earlier with the co-authors of the book. Now, joining us from the studios of WGBH in Boston, Mark Richardson is director of the Botanic Garden at the New England Wildflower Society. Dan Jaffe, propagator and stock bed grower for the New England Wildflower Society, also photographer for this book that they co-authored. Mark and Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Happy thank you here. so much for having us. I'll start with you, Mark. Tell us about New England Wildflower Society and how both of you decided to work on this book. Sure, yeah. Um, really happy to be here. Thanks for having us. New England Wildflower Society is uh, really the nation's oldest plant conservation organization. We've been around for about 118 years altogether. We're, uh, we're really focused on conserving and prom promoting native plants in a lot of different ways. We work with um, state agencies all throughout New England um, to you know preserve and protect uh, rare and endangered species. And we also try to inspire people to use more native plants in their own gardens at home. Uh, we have a botanic garden called Garden in the Woods in Framingham, Massachusetts. It's about um, 45 acres altogether and a series of really beautiful naturalistic landscape display gardens, uh, primarily focused on, on native plants in the landscape. Um, we also grow a lot of plants um, from wild collected seed uh, at our nursery called Nasami Farm out in western Massachusetts. Um, and I, I think the book is really an extension of the work that we do at the Botanic Garden um, and also through the nursery. We're you know, really trying to get people excited about using native plants in their own um, home gardens. Natives are, you know, really beautiful. Uh, I think that's the first thing that we really try to remind people or, or try to emphasize with people. Um, and they're also very supportive of local ecosystems. We've done a, a past show on seed banks. I understand New England Wildflower uh, Society is working on a, a program to help bank the seeds of endangered plants. 
Yeah, that's right. We are the region's seed bank. So we work with um, a team of hundreds of volunteers um, and all the state agencies, the natural heritage programs in each each um, state to set priorities for monitoring rare populations um, and really trying to figure out which ones need to be preserved in, in uh, long-term cold storage in our seed bank. So we have you know hundreds of collections of, uh, of seed that we make each year um, and bring that germplasm, that material back so that if, uh, you know, it's really an insurance policy against um, the decline or the disappearance of, of rare species in our region. Uh, Dan, when we talk about native plants, uh, tell us more about what we mean when we say that and some and how you got started at, at uh, the, the uh, Wildflower Society. Sure. Um, well, I'll start with the easy one, uh, kind of how I got started. The, the how to define native, we could have written in a whole book just <laughs> on that. Um, I, I, I came down from Maine, um, having actually originally grew up in Connecticut. Um, I was working up in Maine at a local nursery, and I was, uh, you know, pretty much kind of in, in the world of standard horticulture. Um, I was looking to kind of expand a little bit. I had just started getting into native plants, and I heard about this cool place called Garden in the Woods and how they had internships. And I headed down there for what was supposed to be a six-month internship. And eight years later, I'm still there, and I've gone from kind of intern to job and job to career. And just kind of haven't left. Um, every time I even think about going somewhere, some cool new project comes up, like writing a book or, you know, other similar sort of things. Um, so there's the easy question. The, the tough one is how we kind of define a native. Um, this, I've, I've got literally an entire lecture on defining native, and at the end, I don't know if we're any closer to coming up with a good solid definition. There's, there's a lot of kind of nuances involved, but the, the basic idea is that these are plants that are indigenous to the area that we're talking about. Um, and you need to define that area. Um, just to say a plant is native doesn't really mean anything unless, um, in our case, we're talking about native plants of New England. Um, and even that is kind of a little tricky because New England is a, is a political line. You know, we're, we're, our states don't really matter to plants much. It's, it's not like you've got, you know, the Republican plants up in Maine and the Democratic ones down in Connecticut. You know, it's, it, so plants are much more interested in, in rainfall patterns and hardiness zones and, you know, kind of soil geology. And all of those characteristics go into creating something we call the ecoregions. Um, the ecoregions are based on all these kind of natural factors, and that's how we define native, at least from a geographic scale. Um, it makes a lot more sense, and it actually takes a lot of guesswork out of kind of picking plants and, and gardening. Um, we were just talking the other day about how we haven't actually checked hardiness zone on any of the plants we worked with in a long, long time, because when you work with native plants, you automatically know that they're hardy. It's, it just kind of simplifies things. Um, the next piece of it is defining time, um, which is always tougher. The, the simple answer is we say native plants are, are plants that are naturally occurring pre-European settlement. Um, it's kind of a, a line in the sand, and it it's, comes with some you know, benefits and some troubles. Um, but the basic idea is that if you're talking about pre-European settlement, you're talking about plants that, that didn't come across an ocean on you know, a ship. They're, they're plants that, that were moved around on much more kind of uh, natural local levels. And so that kind of native value that is inquisitive in these plants really holds true. Um, a plant coming from Europe doesn't have nearly the same value as a plant coming, say, from Connecticut up into Maine. Um, and that's where kind of, that's how we've simplified native, at least to a working level. Now, Dan, you mentioned ecoregions. Uh, you have a map in your book. Again, we're talking about uh, Native Plants for New England Gardens. This is a new book by co-authors Mark Richardson and Dan Jaffe, who join us today from the studios of WGBH in Boston. Uh, what ecoregions are in Connecticut? So Connecticut is, is well, there's, I guess you'd say there's two ecoregions in Connecticut. Um, it's mostly dominated by the northeastern coastal zone, which is probably about three quarters of the state. Um, but you also, um, in the north kind of western part of Connecticut, you get a kick of the, the northeastern highlands, which runs kind of um, north throughout New England into Canada even. Um, and so when we're, um, when we're kind of talking about native plants, we, we found that the best thing to do isn't to tell people what to plant, but better to kind of give them all the information that they could use themselves. Um, so at, at Garden in the Woods, for example, we're a regional organization, and we define native based on all five ecoregions of New England because we're a New England organization. Um, my garden, you know, in, in a western kind of central Massachusetts, if I want to really define native, I'm probably just working out of just the northeastern coastal zone, which is, you know, my, my local ecoregion. Um, that being said, we also try and kind of keep things much more practical for people. Um, the idea that you're somehow doing bad by planting a, you know, a tomato or a rosemary in your garden is, is not at all necessary. Um, what we kind of go with isn't necessarily just plant natives, but plant more natives. 
Um, the only plants we're going to tell you not to plant are the invasive species. Other than that, we just want to see people working with these plants more often. But it doesn't mean you have to uh, go excluding all the others either. Let's talk about some specifics. Uh, when I think of native plants, sometimes when I'm hiking, you may you may notice a, a plant that you don't have in your backyard, but it's growing naturally in the woods. Uh, uh, one of the first times I saw the cardinal flower was along the Connecticut River, and it's just a beautiful uh, flower. Uh, Mark Richardson, explain to us what the cardinal flower is and, and what areas are best suited for that particular plant. Yeah, so we, we have um, a couple different species of cardinal flower, really. Um, one is Lobelia cardinalis, which is our red cardinal flower. That's uh, a beautiful native plant. It's got bright red flowers, which is kind of a rarity, uh, in, in at least in our native flora. Um, it's really supportive of hummingbirds. Uh, so hummingbirds are the primary pollinators. Uh, hummingbirds and, and moths and butterf- or butterflies, really, that have really long tongues that can get down to that nectar reward that's at the base of uh, a really long tubular flower. Uh, we also have another related species called uh, Lobelia syphilitica, which is uh, great blue Lobelia. Um, that's a fairly rare species. It's actually the, the one that's on the cover of the book. Uh, it's, it's rare in the wild in New England, but it's a great garden plant. Um, and it's a, a really beautiful one. Both of them prefer wet soils, um, more so Lobelia cardinalis than syphilitica. Um, but they also will you know, tolerate your standard sort of average garden soil. Um, definitely want full sun. And one thing that's unique about uh, the red cardinal flower in particular um, is that it's a pretty short-lived plant. Uh, it's, it's essentially a biennial, um, so it's really one that needs to seed itself around in your garden. So it's important to let it uh, complete its life cycle, meaning allow it to flower, allow it to set seed, allow that seed to spread around. Uh, otherwise, you won't really have any more cardinal flower in your garden the following year. Uh, it's one that really needs to seed around quite a bit. But it's a, uh, they're both great plants. We love to feature them at Garden in the Woods. We have a, a great display at, at the garden called our Old Meadow Garden. Um, and last year just had hundreds and hundreds of Lobelia syphilitica uh, blooming in concert with some goldenrods and, and, uh, and some nice contrasting um, uh, other colors that were just brilliant. Just a really, really outstanding uh, display. Um, I wanted to go back to to, Jan, uh, to Dan Jaffe. Uh, we were hearing Mark talk about the cardinal flower. This is a, a plant that does well in moist areas. And that hits on my next question of um, people who want to work on their gardens. They need to know about um, the type of soil they have, the, how much sunlight they get. Um, what are the best ways for them to, to learn about um, the area where they live and then figure out what plants work for that particular spot, Dan? Yeah, um, I'd say, you know, the the first step is to kind of just get outside and start really paying attention to your landscape. Um, Try and make a note of when the sun actually hits the site that that you're thinking about planting, and then try and also make notes throughout the day as to when that sun actually disappears, and get a general sense of of actually how many hours of direct sun you've got um, on your spot. Um, The other thing that can work really wonderfully, I I can't recommend enough um, good soil testing. It it doesn't need to be fancy and it's not very expensive. Um, Most cooperative extensions offer soil testing and it's literally a matter of digging up a couple, you know, things of soil, drying them out and sending them off and they'll tell you what is in your soil and kind of give you recommendations as to what you might want to do with your soil. Um, but the other thing that we really kind of jump on at at, um, at New England Wildflower Society is is not to fight nature. Um, the the kind of cool thing about native plants is we've got a plant that'll grow in absolutely any conditions you can think of. So a, a lot of times when I'm talking to people who say they've got very sunny, very dry, very well drained sites, they'll immediately start thinking about you know how much compost do I need to bring in? Um, you know what sort of irrigation system should I install? How do I improve the soils? Um, and I'll immediately jump towards a, a large range of plants that will thrive in the conditions they've got present without any need for additional inputs. Um, it's kind of the nice thing about the, the native flora. There's, there's such a wide range of things that there are plants that will grow in those really sunny, dry spots, the same way there are plants that will grow in very you know, dark, acidic, shady spots. And some of them happen to be really, really cool species that don't do well in kind of what we normally think of as the good garden soils. Um, you know, one of the ones that comes up to mind for me is that there's a, an aster called stiff aster. It's um, Ionactus linearifolia. Um, it's a plant that thrives in sunny, sandy sites. You see it in coastal regions. Um, I've actually got some in a meadow up the road for me that's just very, very sandy. Um, I've tried planting it in good garden soils, and it just doesn't really do all that well. Um, that being said, in the sunny, sandy sites, you've got a fabulous flower that shows up in kind of late summer, early fall, and blooms pretty much until the, the cold season really kicks in. 
And it's one of those few perennials that has some really nice fall color, um, something we normally think is kind of restricted to the woody plants. But there's a couple perennial standouts for that, and this is definitely one of them. So it sounds like when you know, again, the area that you have in your backyard, what works best for it, and you can uh, pick and choose the plants uh, that don't require a lot of maintenance, it, it actually saves you on time, but also better for the environment, Mark. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I think it's always important to choose plants for the site. Um, you know, we, we like to say that native plants are adapted to our region, and so uh, they really require fewer inputs, so less water, less fertilizer, um, you know, less of your time, less of your money, really. Uh, but it, it's still important to choose plants that are adapted to the particular site conditions that your garden has. So I think Dan gave some good recommendations about how to determine your site conditions. One of the things I would like to point out is in the back of the book, we have an appendix that has sort of our top 10 plants for uh, specific sites. So we've got a list of plants for dry sites, a list of plants for shady sites, a list for pl- of plants for moist to wet sites. And this is really meant to be a list that you can bring to the garden center with you and say, listen, I've got a wet site. I'm really interested in these 10 plants. Uh, show me what they look like. I'd, I'd, I'd like to include them in my garden. And I think it's always important that we're choosing plants for the site rather than choosing you know, that pretty pink flower or that, that pretty purple flower and then figuring out if it's going to work in our garden. That's that's sort of a recipe for failure. Um, so we always try to make sure that people understand what their site conditions are before they choose plants. Uh, now, before we take a call, I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about where is the best place for Connecticut residents to buy native plants? Because it's so easy, again, uh, you'll see those uh, the, the colorful plants in the bigger box stores, uh, and they may not have a lot of these native species that are included in your book, Mark. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. A, a lot of nurseries and garden centers sell native plants without necessarily marketing them as native. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the, the prime example of this is the highbush blueberry, which, you know, is a really common garden plant. When people start getting into edibles, it's one of the first plants they gravitate toward. Um, and it's it's a great native species, and it's, it's not always marketed as such. And so a lot of the big box stores and a lot of nurseries that don't necessarily market native plants still have a wide array of them available. Um, but in, in, instead of making a you know a specific recommendation for a nursery or a garden center, I think what I will do is is um, you know encourage people to ask a, a simple uh, or a simple question when they visit a garden center, uh, and that's whether their plants have been treated with systemic insecticides. Um, systemic insecticides have gotten a lot of attention uh, recently. People are familiar with the term neonic. Um, these are uh, compounds that are long lived in in plants. They're applied. Uh, they're absorbed by a plant's vascular system, and then they become toxic to really anything that feeds on them. Um, one of the things that we're really trying to do with natives is is encourage wildlife and encourage beneficial insects, uh, especially things like pollinators. Um, and by using plants that have been treated with systemic insects insecticides, we're essentially making them toxic to that wildlife that we're trying to support. Um, so I, I think the recommendation that I would have for people is, you know, look for garden centers that uh, that say that they don't treat their plants with systemic systemic insecticides, and they're likely to have native plants um, available. Kim's calling from New Haven. Kim, go ahead. Hi. um, This is Kim Stoner from the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. I have a lot of information about planting for pollinators on the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station website. We have a prominent picture of goldenrod with lots of bumblebees all over it. So I would recommend that as a place to look at um, information about native plants for goldenrod and how to establish native plant meadows. We have a lot of information about that. And we have lists from the Xerxes Society uh, uh, for uh, invertebrate conservation of good native plants for pollinators in the Northeast. Thank you, Kim, uh, for your call. Uh, Jim's calling from Windsor Locks. Jim, go ahead. Yes, I'm, I'm calling about Japanese knotweed. I've been fighting this stuff for ages. I mow it every year, uh, every month, uh, and it, I just can't seem to get rid of it. And I've tried just about everything, and I don't really want to spray with uh, Roundup or anything like that. Do you have a uh, recommendation for some sort of a grass or some sort of a wild plant that I can seed like late um, August, uh, uh, September-ish, that will pop up before the knotweed comes out and chokes it out? Uh, good questions. Uh, Mark, do you want to take that one? I, actually, Dan was chomping at the bit okay, to answer ahead, that Dan. one, so I think I'll let him take it. 
All right. Um, yeah, well, there, so the, the problem with knotweed, um, being an invasive species, it's kind of got the upper hand. Um, so uh, we don't really have any native plants that could just outcompete the invasives without some extra help on our part. Um, if we did, they'd, they'd, well, I don't know if they'd be invasive, but they'd be much weedier than they normally are. Um, knotweed is, is a real pain in the butt, though. It has a way of kind of constantly coming back over and over again. Um, am I correct in assuming this is growing in a sunny site? Oh yes, and and it's right near a, a water source, and it's it's sandy, dry soil. It's not really wet soil. Uh, it, it, that stuff likes to dry, uh, grow in that stuff, you know, that kind of a soil. Yeah. So one of the things that I've I actually had a patch of this stuff up in Maine at an apartment I was living at. It took me about four years to finally get on top of it and, and kill it off. And I did the same thing as you. I was I was mowing it back regularly, and it kind of kept coming back for more. I was eating as much of it as I possibly could, and it was coming back for more. I, I kept you know I tried everything, and nothing really worked until I eventually. Um, stumbled across this idea of solarizing, um, which I wouldn't say was a one-time job, um, but with a couple of seasons of work, I got it out, and it got it out fully, um, and it doesn't require the use of any, you know, kind of um, chemical applications. Um, solarizing is pretty much going to be using the, the power of the sun to pretty much just bake the area. And what you're looking to do is, is kind of lay down some plastic sheeting on top of this stuff. Um, you're going to want to kind of do what you've been doing, um, cut it down in the, the early season, and then go in there and lay some nice clear, um, as thick as you can, plastic on top of it. Um, you want to leave all the kind of stuff that you cut down right in there. And it's not a bad idea to water the site right after, you know, right before you lay it down, because you're going to want to build up a little bit of steam pressure in there. Pin down the sides and let the sun just do its work and roast away at the thing. Um, especially with Japanese knotweed, you're going to want to be vigilant because it's going to start by trying to push through that plastic. And it's it's almost definitely going to, you know, in some areas, push through the plastic. And you're going to want to kind of get in there and, and clip back whatever's pushing through, knock it back down, give a patch of new plastic over it, kind of keep at it. Once you get on top of it, though, with some kind of vigilance in that first season, it, it should start to just kind of bake away. And the nice thing about um, solarizing is it does more than just kills the, the upper section. It's going to get into the roots as well. Um, different, you know, organizations have done different tests, but you found that in, in the right conditions, you can get, you know, temperatures raising up into the 120, 130 degrees, um, you know, within the top couple inches of soil. And that can really do the trick. Um, the other thing I'd say is with any invasive removal that you ever do, um, you know, I, I hear a lot about people removing invasives and, and rarely do I hear about the second part of the equation, which is once the invasive's out there, you've got to put something else in its place, preferably something strong and, and vigorous that can really act as competitive pressure to, you know, that, that one or two seeds that might have survived or the little bit of root or whatever might still be there, um, so, you know, up in Maine, when I was working in, in a similar site, it was also dry. We, we got rid of the Japanese knotweed, and then we went and planted staghorn sumac in there and actually undersowed it with some, uh, with some goldenrods. Um, staghorn sumac is a, is a beautiful species. It's absolutely fabulous. I, I would love this plant so much more if I could use it more regularly, um, but it is a vigorous spreader. It really does want to take some space. It's probably not a great choice for, you know, a small garden setting, but to push back against an invasive or maybe fill up a parking lot island, it's a, it's a really great choice. Well, we're getting a tweet from a listener uh, who wanted us to highlight that the value of natives to increase biodiversity in city parks. Residents can ask municipalities to add wildflower meadows and native shrubs can reduce mowing costs. Uh, that sounds like a good idea, Mark Richardson. Yeah, it's always a good idea. I mean, what you know, one of the things that you you really learn pretty quickly when you start working with natives is that you know we're we're trying to uh, you're really supporting wildlife, all sorts of wildlife. And um, you know, when you think about birds, I mean, everyone loves birds. I think people oftentimes are a little bit hesitant to embrace insects at first, but when you think about birds and supporting birds, the best way to do that is to plant native plants that uh, that actually support insects, uh, which birds feed upon. So I, I think something like 90 or 95 percent of our native birds um, feed insects to their young. Uh, without plants to support those insects, uh, we wouldn't have birds. And so, you know, one of the best ways to support local bird populations is to, is to plant natives in your garden. Um, so biodiversity is definitely a, a great uh, sort of, uh, uh, I guess, side effect of using natives in your garden is supporting all that great wildlife that we love. Thanks to Mark Richardson and Dan Jaffe. They joined us from the studios of WGBH in Boston. Uh, they work at New England Wildflower Society in Massachusetts, co-authors of this new book, Native Plants for New England Gardens. It's really a lovely book. We thank you so much, Mark and Dan, for joining us today to tell us more about native plants uh, and the benefits uh, to where we live. Thank you so much, Mark and Dan. Sure, it was our pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's been a blast.
I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by senior producer Lydia Brown. You can learn more about our show at wmpr.org slash where we live. Thanks for listening.